What's Europe's next move? But with Kharkiv subject to a daily pounding from the other side of the Russian border, a border that's just 30 kilometers away, it's in the name of Kharkiv that Emmanuel Macron on a state visit to Germany, with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz nodding in agreement, said he'd allow French missiles supplied to Ukraine to, as he put it, neutralize military targets on Russian soil. That comes on top of talk of French military advisors sent to the front line. Vladimir Putin quick to react Tuesday with threats against the West as a whole and what sounds a lot like the uh, Baltic states in particular. With Russian troops now on the offensive and Ukraine desperately waiting for supplies of not just missiles but also ammunition and eventually fighter jets, how close is the day when NATO and Russian troops actually square off face to face on the battlefield? 11 days out from European elections, how does public opinion here feel about it? And what's NATO's biggest uh, member going to say? The United States, which for now refuses uh, to allow its weaponry to strike inside of Russian territory. Can the alliance speak with one voice at this crucial juncture? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're asking, is hitting Russian territory the only <clears throat> way to defend Kharkiv? And with us, retired uh, General Dominique Trincon, former head of the French military mission to the United Nations. Good Thanks evening. for being with us. Thanks as well to French Member of Parliament Mireille Clapeau of Emmanuel Macron's Renaissance Party, Vice President of the National Assembly's Foreign Affairs Committee. Good to see you. Hello. Uh, we're good to see you as well. George Kuzmanovich, who tops the Sovereign Republic Party's slate of candidates for the upcoming European elections. Welcome back to the show. Good evening. And from Kyiv, France 24 correspondent Gulliver Cragg. How are you doing, Gulliver? Good evening. More and more of you, by the way, listening, listening liking and subscribing to the France 24 debate on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other fine streaming services. This Wednesday alone, at least eight civilians killed along the vast front line in Ukraine, including a missile attack in the northeastern Sumy region. Uh, the uh, two dead and three injured there. Uh, Gulliver Craig, whether it's in Sumy and neighboring Kharkiv region, it's a daily grind. Yes, both Sumy region and Kharkiv region are subjected to daily cross-border shellings. There were also civilians killed in Donetsk region today, I believe. The Ukrainian army's report this evening said that the most intense fighting, if we're talking about fighting on the ground, was happening in Donetsk region with the Russians' attempt to push towards the town of Pokrovsk, but that there was also intense fighting in Kharkiv region, not in the north part of Kharkiv region, where the Russians um, opened that new front on the 10th of May. They said that the Russians are still trying to push forward there, but it's more or less under control. But there's more intense fighting now happening in the east of Kharkiv region, where uh, the front line goes pretty much along the border between Kharkiv region and Luhansk region, near the town of Kupyansk, which is still in Ukrainian hands. Yeah, and that brings us to uh, what was discussed uh, during that state visit. Dateline, the Palace of Meseburg, north of Berlin on Tuesday the setting for the last day of a three-day state visit by the French president to Germany. It's there that Emmanuel Macron moved the same red line that the UK had moved earlier this month. How do we explain to Ukrainians that we're going to have to protect these towns and basically everything we see around Kharkiv at the moment if we tell them that they're not allowed to reach the point where the missiles are fired from? We tell them we're supplying you with weapons, but you can't defend yourselves. We stay exactly within the same framework. We think that we should allow them to neutralize the military sites from which the missiles are fired. The missiles and basically the military sites from which Ukraine is attacked. But we mustn't allow them to hit other targets in Russia. Dominique Trincon, is this the first time since February 2022 where we have this situation where the front line is the border? Uh, yes, the front line is the border uh, north of uh, Donbass, which is a, a new position. Uh, initially, uh, during the first two months, in fact, the Russians were attacking Kharkiv. Mm. They were on the border of the, on the suburb, sorry, of uh, Kharkiv, but they were not able to capture uh, Kharkiv. And then in, uh, in uh, September 22, in fact, they, they were pushed uh, very far away from Kharkiv and uh, out on the Russian border. Um, so now there is this attack on Kharkiv. Uh, I think there are two reasons. The first reasons explained by the Russian is that they want to establish a buffer zone between Belgorod and, uh, and Kharkiv. I, I think it's, uh, 
it's not the good reason because anyway there are drones who are launched there and so the range is not a problem. Uh, the main problem, I think, is that the effort, the main Russian effort, is in Donbas. And so they want to have the reserves from the Ukrainian forces leaving Donbas and going to the north. And then you are uh, threatening the Donbas, and that's what's happening currently. And the Russians are advancing in Donbas. What are these... What, what is Emmanuel Macron talking about? What are the French weapons that would be used and that would be used for cross-border attacks? In fact, the only uh, long-range weapon system we are providing are scalp, which are, have to be uh, carried by an aircraft. So, in fact, uh, these scalp were already used in uh, Crimea, for example. And it's what the UK is roughly... Yeah, it's, it's the well. same. Uh, Storm Shadow and scalp is the same weapon system. Um, so... Now he's talking about sending in in Russian territory as uh, it was launched before in occupied uh, in Ukraine occupied territory like Crimea or Donbas. So that's why he's saying that Belgorod, for example, is uh, is the logistic hub for for the Russian forces. So what he's saying is that you have to fight where the military uh, forces are. And uh, part of them are in Belgorod or around Belgorod. This is a red line that's being pushed, Mireille Clapeau. In a way, yes, but uh, I would uh, remind you uh, the exact words of um, Emmanuel Macron, especially when uh, he spoke uh, at the Sorbonne. Um, he wants uh, to have a strategic ambiguity. So he doesn't want to explain exactly uh, the lines and he doesn't uh, neither deny nor confirm uh, the interpretation of uh, what he said. And uh, it's true that uh, now he explains uh, that um, we cannot help uh, Ukraine by delivering weapons uh, if we don't allow Ukraine to hit the original points uh, where it, uh, it starts from. And uh, in a way, yes, it's a new possibility, but it doesn't mean that it will be done by uh, Ukraine. All right, Macron's strategic ambiguity drawing a sharp warning of consequences for Western countries that supply weapons that hit Russian territory. Vladimir Putin speaking Tuesday on a trip to Uzbekistan. Representatives of NATO countries, especially in Europe, especially in small countries, they must be aware of what they are playing with. They must remember that this is, as a rule, a state with a small territory and a very dense population. And this is a factor that they should keep in mind before talking about striking deep into Russian territory. This is serious stuff. We, of course, are observing and watching this very carefully. Uh, Mireille Clapeau, should we be nervous? This is, you know, the president of nuclear-armed Russia making threats. What sounds like not just to Ukraine, but uh, to NATO allies. First of all, uh, Vladi Vladimir Putin is uh, lying all the time. Remember, uh, before the 24th so of it's February, bluff, uh, 22, he's not telling the truth anyway. And uh, uh, as he was elected in uh, uh, unequal conditions, as you know, he doesn't have uh, a public opinion uh, who he should uh, be uh, accountable for. So first, he's always uh, lying. And second, um, he was the aggressor and uh, he, he, he did escalation. So, and he's always the threatening of uh, nuclear weapon, uh, weapon or uh, counter attacks. So uh, we, we shouldn't uh, believe him and we should establish um, a, a good uh, a report of uh, forces be before. George Kuzmanovic. Well, uh, I agree completely with what uh, General Trincan said, but we have to be precise. Uh, Ukraine has every right to hit Russia while they are in war with Russia. And they did it already. Even Moscow, they're sending drones and they used all their old Soviet long-range missiles. But using scalps for the French and uh, these long-range missiles. Yeah, it's not the, the, they have the right or not the right. Is who is programming those weapons? Because those we weapons are used to uh, hit fixed targets, 
and most of the Ukrainian military do not have the capacity to program the uh, hitting point. It's military people from NATO who are doing it. So that's why, until now, when it's hitting Crimea or Donbass, well, Russians are closing their eyes. Right? They perfectly know who is doing that. And that's why all the European leaders were pissed off when uh, Macron blindly said, oh yeah, it's our guys, British and the French, who are programming those weapons. And that's why uh, the Bundestag and uh, Olaf Scholz doesn't want to send the Tauruses because they will have to, to bring military people who will program those missiles. And that's the issue. Because here we will have uh, an implication of military people from NATO hitting a nuclear country, which is Russia, which is completely and totally insane. So let's bring them weapons that are not... Uh, but how do you, defend, are not how do you defend Kharkiv? <laughs> well, first, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, we have a huge corruption uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And where are the defenses we've paid for? They are not. They're nothing. It's, 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 it's catastrophic. They had a year. The Russians did a huge three-line defense uh, when they retrieved from Kherson with, during this, uh, the, the uh, first uh, Ukrainian counter, successful counter-offensive. But no defense have been built. Uh, built. And the same in Sumy. You will have this, uh, the same uh, attack because they will continue to stretch the, the Ukraine reserves. Uh, soon, you, you are all the shellings uh, around Sumy. You will have a new offensive around Sumy, so the line will be completely stretched, and you, have, you don't have defenses. But anyway, uh, I think, from my point of view, which is the same like many uh, realistic analysts in USA, what is happening now, it's insane. As Jens Stoltenberg said, this is a war of NATO extension. And what is going on, it's the death of half a million Ukrainian, nine million left the country, the country is destroyed. What what we can have is more deaths and more destruction, but we can't have a defeat of Russia because it's a nuclear country. So what we have in, in the future, it's maybe an absurd and completely insane uh, nuclear war. General Tranko. <clears throat> we must be very careful with the words we are uh, using. It's not NATO attacking. Uh, I just remind you that NATO is a defensive organization. It's French or UK forces bilaterally were helping a country which has been attacked under Rule 51 of the uh, UN Charter. They are authorized to help the country which is attacked. Secondly, talking about... But if the Russians are striking back the French territory or British territory... In of, course in not. of course not. Uh, after two and a half years of fighting in Ukraine, uh, Russia was not able to defeat Ukraine. How can Ukraine, uh, Russia face Europe? They, they, they don't have the mean. And when we're talking that you can't defeat a nuclear power like uh, Russia, I just remind you that Russia was defeated in Afghanistan and there was no problem. I mean, it is the responsibility of Mr. Putin who decided to, go, go. to attack Ukraine and Ukraine has the right to defend itself and European country bilaterally have the right to help Ukraine. And that's it. Go and when you are providing weapon system, you're not saying don't use there, don't use there, don't use there. And some people are a bit shy about that. They don't have to be shy because Putin is not shy. So we, we have to be strong in front of a man who is strong. G Gulliver Craig, tell us, uh, uh, having been back and forth to the front lines, uh, right now, wh what's the situation when it comes to... Uh, we've, we've talked extensively about the, the lack of ammunition, more is promised in the days to come. Uh, I wanted to go back on what George Krasmanovich was saying about the defences that the Ukrainians started building probably too late, invested probably not enough money in them, and a lot of people in Ukraine are asking, where are those defences lines? Why are they not stronger? Uh, the fact is that um, there have been 
a lot of reasons, I mean, to think that there's been corruption. Um, and investigative journalists in Ukraine actually say that in Kharkiv region, it's particularly bad. They can't get any transparent information, even about the price that was paid for the concrete. They say it's a state secret, whereas in other regions, there's more transparency, which would make us think that there's a particularly bad problem with corruption in Kharkiv region. But all that being said, the Russians opened this front, advanced pretty quickly in the first few days, and now they kind of seem to have been stopped with this new front in the north of Kharkiv. So I wouldn't exaggerate too much how much of a problem the lack of these defensive lines is being. And of course, it's two separate things. The lack of defensive lines that are allowing the Russians to advance in various places along the front line and the bombardment of cities like Kharkiv, because the missiles, of course, fly over uh, the defensive lines. And what the and the glided bombs uh, in particular that are launched from uh, airplanes, uh, these um, guided glide bombs, the Ukrainians would like to shoot down the planes over Russian territory. It's not the French um, scouts that they would be using to do that. They'd like to use uh, American made Patriot weapons, I suppose. And uh, that's kind of a different question. Macron was very precise in saying we can let them strike bases inside Russian territory. He didn't mention shooting down planes or anything else. Right. And among right. those who agree with Emmanuel Macron, the outgoing NATO Secretary General, without naming the United States, Jens Stoltenberg, clearly targeting Washington in remarks he made in an interview with uh, The Economist magazine. But uh, the, the one-two punch of Macron and Stoltenberg, not enough to sway the Biden administration. There's uh, no change to our policy at this point. We don't encourage or enable the use of U.S. supplied weapons to strike inside Russia. Uh, I would note that, uh, that uh, uh, the Ukrainians have, uh, in the past, uh, defeated imminent air attacks, uh, such as some of the ones that have occurred uh, in the last few days on their own since the war began. A lead editorial writer in uh, French broadsheet of record, Le Monde, uh, stating that uh, the U.S. just doesn't see this as an existential threat, whereas Europe does. Is this an existential threat, what's going on? What, how do you explain this discrepancy between the French attitude and the American attitude right now? Yes, uh, Europe can die um, if um, we do not uh, manage to stop uh, this uh, horrible aggression uh, from Russia. Uh, Russia come, could come uh, directly to the uh, eastern borders of Europe and uh, it's, uh, Russia is already uh, uh, putting some, um, creating some problems at the borders of uh, Estonia, Finland, uh, Lithuania. And uh, we could imagine that the next step uh, would be a, a direct threat of uh, Russia to, the, to Europe. And uh, this is why we have to consider very seriously this threat. And of course, the you, you heard Gulliver States... Craig saying that it, American weaponry can take down planes. How do you, again, do you agree or disagree with the American decision to forbid, for the time being, the use of its long-range weaponry uh, over the border in Russia? We should prevent escalation, for sure. And uh, we should um, remind the international rights. Uh, no civilian uh, should be uh, killed by uh, these uh, weapons. But again, uh, Ukraine uh, has the right uh, to, uh, to have a self-defense against this aggression. Uh, Dominique Tancan, you heard the U.S. position. How do you explain it? I, I explain it by the fact that the, the American don't want to face directly Russia. They, they are supporting... Uh, and the French do? I mean, we are in Europe. Europeans can decide without, uh, without the agreement of the American when there is threat <clears throat> about Europe. And President Macron is very clear about the fact that Europe at a stage should be autonomous in its decision. Of course, currently, the defense of Europe is made by NATO with the US. The support of Ukraine is made by country individually and by European Union, not by NATO. And uh, by the way, what uh, Secretary General of uh, NATO said, he had no mandate to, to say that. I just remind you that he's a civil servant. He should only have the words of, given by the all country in Europe, uh, in uh, NATO, sorry. And nobody gave him the right to do that. The main explanation is that the Americans don't agree. So I, he's living in July, so perhaps he feel a bit free to say what he wants, but he, he was wrong to say that. It's not the position of NATO. It's uh, the position of different countries. The French have this position. The UK has this position. 
the American don't have this position, and that's it. I, I mentioned at the outset, George Kuzmanovich, how uh, when Macron was speaking Tuesday, uh, standing next to him was the German Chancellor, who nodded in agreement, but didn't commit to doing the same thing with uh, German long-range weapons. Yeah, of course. The, the, for the reason I said uh, prior to this, and for the reason you said, because it's a coalition, it's complicated, and the Bundestag voted again, so he cannot do what he wants. Not like our president, who really, I'm sorry, is, is, is an insane person. He almost started a civil war in New Caledonia without listening to anybody saying, don't do that in the way you will to do it. He said, don't care. I will do it. I'm the boss. It will be and catastrophe, full catastrophe. So it's the same here. He's taking decisions that are very dangerous. And uh, uh, Mr. Craig know perfectly, yeah, Russians are not uh, going further uh, in Kharkiv, but they sent fewer uh, battalions without uh, uh, tanks. Uh, 50,000 at least soldiers are waiting as a reserve in, uh, in Belgorod. And uh, they're moving, as you said, clearly uh, on, the, on the Donbass uh, front. Uh, it's, it's a huge problem and they can push further uh, in, uh, on Kharkov with the Kharkiv, with the reserves. Uh, what they could not do in the first phase of the war because they attacked a huge country with less than 200,000 soldiers, as you know. Now we are with the, the Ukrainian intelligence saying it's half a million soldiers plus 300,000 coming. You imagine the power that's coming to Ukraine and we are, I'm sorry to say that because we have to say it, we are unable. It's not that we don't want, we're sending what we can, we are unable to send weapons. In 91, in France, we had 1,300 tanks. We have 226. What can we do? And it's the same on everything, especially ammunition. Go, so go over crack, seen from where you are in Kyiv. <clears throat> how, how does it look when it turns to, when Ukraine, and we've seen the president this week, uh, go sign bilateral deals in places like Spain, Belgium. Uh, how does it seem when they, when they look to, their, uh, to, to, to NATO allies? It all seems extremely worrying because uh, people who, you know, have a better knowledge of the situation with the arms industry and the political situation in Western allies of Ukraine know that George Kuzmanovich is to a large degree right. There isn't the capacity to give Ukraine the help that may very well be needed. I mean, when you talk to people, what always ends up coming up in conversations is that, you know, hopefully the Russians will screw up somehow or hopefully something will happen in Russia or some unexpected black one event will sort of change the dynamics of what's going on. Otherwise, it does look extremely difficult to see how Ukraine can get together enough manpower and firepower to really push back this um, Russian offensive. On the other hand, it's encouraging that the Russians aren't doing better. I still think that it's surprising and encouraging that they aren't already advancing um, faster than they are. And the other thing that I'd say is that seen from Ukraine, the idea of the nuclear threat and the idea that any kind of escalation is possible, that's just the thing that, you know, Ukrainians generally find very exasperating because they just don't believe Russia would use nuclear weapons for various reasons and various arguments that are put forward. And they don't believe any other kind of escalation is possible. Russia is already trying as hard as it can, basically. Now, there's a, another controversy in this country, and that's over boots on the ground. On the eve of uh, Macron's remarks uh, in Germany, the Ukrainian military thanking France, perhaps prematurely, perhaps not, for sending military instructors to help with the deployment of the military hardware we've been talking about. Siobhan Silk has that story. Around 50,000 Ukrainian soldiers have received training in EU countries. But as yet, no ally has sent instructors to Ukraine to conduct drills on the recruits' home soil. On Tuesday, EU Foreign Chief Joseph Borrell said member states were split on the prospect. France's government was the first to suggest it might send boots on the ground. On the Telegram messaging app on Monday, the commander-in-chief of Ukraine's armed forces announced that France was indeed preparing to send military instructors to Ukraine. Alexander Sirsky said he'd already signed the documents that would allow the first French instructors to visit Ukrainian training centres and get acquainted with their infrastructure and personnel. But the French Defence Ministry later declined to confirm a deployment was imminent, saying only that it was being studied. Ukraine then backtracked, stating the deployment of trainers was still being discussed with France and other countries. 
The confusion comes as Ukrainian forces have been struggling to cope with renewed Russian pressure on the front line. On his EU visit this week, President Vladimir Zelensky has got new pledges for military aid. But while hardware is one thing, manpower is another. Ukraine's counteroffensive continues to be hampered by a severe shortage of trained soldiers. General Trancon, uh, are the instructors coming? Has a deal been signed? What do we know? Uh, probably uh, the agreement uh, have been signed. Uh, you know, the chief of defense staff, the French def chief of defense staff, was in in Kiev, so he was discussing with the headquarters. So they are organizing the fact that there will be instructor coming in uh, in Ukraine, uh, but the decision is not uh, taken. Probably the Ukrainian were a bit fast on saying that it, this will happen. I think we'll have the news uh, next week by the president himself. Um, the fact is that uh, when you are delivering equipment, you are delivering training. Previously, when we were delivering Cesar uh, guns, for example, the people go, were going in, in Conjuer, which is very far from Ukraine. It took a long time. It was uh, difficult to organize that. The best way is to provide the equipment. Uh, I just remind you that we've got to provide 78 more Caesar weapons to Ukraine. You provide the instructor in situ in Ukraine. Uh, then it will allow Ukrainian instructor to go fighting. And so the French will be there to help Training. Yeah, because where does that instruction take place? Near the front line, not near the front line? Does no, this constitute boots you, on the you ground? You can't train soldier close to the front line. You've got to train soldier at a, at a, at a place where he's not on the fighting. You need to, to be a bit back from there. But second point, you've got equipment who have been on the ground for two years. And now you've got to maintain a lot of this equipment. If you put people who are used to maintain this French equipment, then the Ukrainian will go and fight on the front line. So that's probably what is organized. And, and I guess that everything is organized to do that. The decision has been not put forward. So we'll see that next week, probably. Mireille Clapeau, is this mission creep? You know, the, like little by little without knowing it, the France is directly involved in the war? Maybe a first word, um, this uh, war is hybrid with uh, a battle on earth, uh, in the air, on sea. There is a hybrid war and there is a war of information. And uh, I do not like uh, when uh, Russian propaganda is uh, relayed uh, on the French soil. Th that's my uh, first point. Um, of course, little by little, uh, uh, Russia is uh, making a progress and uh, Ukraine uh, lost a uh, lot of time waiting for the aid from uh, the United States and the ammunition uh, from the uh, European states. And now they are helped by North Korea, by China, by Iran, and uh, they have uh, reconstituted their, their troops, uh, their stock of ammunition. So now we have uh, to be uh, very, uh, very rapid. And uh, it's it's not little by little, uh, it's uh, that uh, we have uh, to help um, Ukraine uh, in a rapid way and uh, to be active. To hear General Trancol say it, it's not mission creep if you're sending instructors and they're not next to the front line. Well, first we know that we have troops on the ground, British, French, American, Canadian, but okay, it's not fighting units. But the question is fighting units or not fighting units, that's it. Uh, and what do you mean by on the ground, though? Well, people were uh, helping uh, in the in the general staffs. Uh, people were uh, um, doing um, intelligence. Well, it, 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 that's fine. Uh, or some special forces. It's okay. It's it's not uh, real fighting units from a NATO country <clears throat> against Russian troops. Now, the, the the problem is, well, why not to do what you said? Fine, let's do it. But the problem is what Gérald Trincon said, is that the first two years of war, the Ukrainians, they had the weaponry, the ammunition from the old Soviet system, which was their army. Plus, all the Eastern country supported them, sending all, almost everything they had in stocks, all, all the, the old system, uh, Soviet uh, weaponry system. Now, it's destroyed. So they have to fight with what we give them 
and we are not able to give them what is needed, not but because you don't want, you want, Macron wants, everybody in Europe wants, but because it's not there. Plus, you have, you had one uh, logic of logistics and maintenance, which uh, uh, the Russian they have. Now on the Ukrainian side, it's different logistics, different maintenance chain. It's very complicated when you run a, a, a war to have so many different uh, weapon system and not enough. So yeah. that's, that's the insanity. So that you can consider it's, it's Russian propaganda. But then Kinan, who's dead, Kissinger, who's dead, Mersham, is, uh, who's uh, still uh, here, and all the realistic Americans are doing Russian propaganda. It's just maths. At the end, if you don't have the proper mean to conduct a war plus the manpower, then it's a catastrophe. So Dominique Trincom, Mireille Clapeau and George Kuzmanovich agreeing that Russia has been able to turn to a war economy or, or had helped in doing so faster than the Ukrainians. Now, though, we get back to the role of the United States, who are trying to put the pressure on China. Yeah, sure. Uh, in Russia, it's very easy when you are leading the country as it is. You don't ask the citizen. You just take decision. And you have a, a huge uh, history about having a big army and a lot of weapons. So it's very easy to do that. Anyway, they were obliged to ask North Korea and Iran to produce weapon system because they have not enough. Uh, the problem is that uh, probably Initially, Putin didn't think that he will be in sort, that sort of a war. Um, so now he's asking China to help him. And China, as usual, is also lying, like uh, Mr. Putin. is saying, OK, I'm not providing weapon system. But in fact, I'm providing small spots which are used to build weapon system. Uh, so in fact, we are in a position who currently, in 2024, after the offensive of 2022, uh, second, second on the Russian side, and then on the Ukrainian side, just remind that the, the Russians were uh, obliged to, to go back east, we are in a sort of balance. The Russian are... Stalemate? Uh, yes, exactly. The Russians are advancing, but very small. I mean, uh, I think the aim of uh, Mr. Putin is to conquer the old Donbass <coughs> and then to say these oblasts, which are an access to Russia, I'm able to solve them, to save them, sorry. And that's the only thing it can happen. He can't invade Ukraine now. He doesn't have the means and he knows that after invasion, you have to occupy and he's not able to occupy uh, uh, Ukraine. So after having wanted to invade Ukraine in 2022, now it just want to keep what you've got with all these oblets occupied. Cover crack, the objective here? That's wishful thinking, unfortunately. I think that Vladimir Putin wants to you know, reassert influence over Ukraine and stop Ukraine from being a democratic Western looking country. And one way or another, we'll continue to try to do that. Perhaps, yes, at some point, there'll be some kind of a ceasefire and Russia remains in control of the parts of Ukraine that it currently occupies only. Uh, but that won't be the end of it. I mean, that's generally the view held in Ukraine. You know, that if it was, I think that a lot of people in Ukraine, if they thought <coughs> just giving Russia the territory that it currently occupies and maybe a bit more would really solve the problem, then a lot more people would be in favor of doing that, even though, of course, I mean, it would be absolutely terrible for all the Ukrainians um, living in those territories who don't want to be ruled by Russia and all of those who fled those territories and are dreaming of going back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, on that point, Gulliver, uh, this week, uh, uh, when we saw uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, making those rounds, uh, inking that bilateral deal with Spain, uh, going to Belgium, which promised down the road F-16s, uh, Zelensky in Brussels urging Joe Biden to attend his peace summit in Switzerland in two weeks' time, saying if the U.S. president's a no-show, quote, it'll be like applauding Putin personally applauding and doing so standing. Why did he use that kind of strong language about uh, what is going to be a talk shop conference in June? 
Yeah, I guess it's quite a long shot, you know, a big bet for Volodymyr Zelensky to make using that kind of language when it's absolutely not clear uh, that Joe Biden will attend that summit. I think uh, the latest signals from the United States were more um, along the lines of uh, representation at a lower level than the president. A lot of heads of state, though, in Europe in particular, heads of government, have said that they will attend. Let's be clear, it's not really a peace summit. The Ukrainians are calling it a peace summit, and they've got an argument for calling it that because basically they think there will never be real peace unless we get the Russians to withdraw from our territory. And they want to get as many countries as possible on board with more or less <laughs> fine. I think that there will be negotiations at this summit and the final communique might be something rather different. But it's about uh, Ukraine showing how many countries in the world support its summit. And that's where it's crucially important, really, for its most important ally, the United States, to be represented at the highest level. But unfortunately, I'm not sure that it looks like happening. So Zelensky might lose a lot of face, uh, you know, having, having laid down the gauntlet in this way, if Biden then doesn't attend. Mary Clapeau, that summit, what's it about? I think... There are two uh, hypotheses. Uh, either um, Ukraine on the front line remains a frozen conflict, and uh, we know that uh, Russia is used uh, to have uh, frozen conflicts. Either there is peace, uh, with a, a peace signed uh, with a concession. And uh, I hope uh, that we will be able to understand first the targets of Russia, because it's not clear for the moment. The first target was to invade uh, Kiev and Ukraine and to prevent uh, Ukraine from uh, being a member of uh, the European Union. But now the targets are not clear. And uh, when we will understand the targets of Russia, uh, I hope we will be able to have a peace and, uh, with the most um, possible people uh, around the table. We know perfectly the targets of Russia. They have been sent, written in many occasions, even before the start of the war, as people who know what's happened uh, know perfectly. By the way, you have an agreement, uh, uh, almost an agreement. Uh, it's a talks, uh, in, uh, peace talks in Istanbul between Ukraine and Russia in March, April 2022. That we broke. And the, the po main Sorry, idea... who broke? Who? Uh, uh, NATO. What? Yeah, which is all it was released in Figaro in Wall Street Journal in the in the Welt. We have this. Uh, I, I didn't and, hear and the, about the this. Main, wait, the say, main. So wait, the, there was the main target of the Russian is neutrality. I remember the peace talks, trade. but I don't remember there being any kind of a deal that was inside. It was not far from it, and that's and it's when uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Boris Johnson went to Kiev and said, "No, no, you continue the war. We will crush a Russian economy. We didn't crush Russian economy. Ukrainians continued and." Firmly, they fought. They did even that better than we expected from them resisting the Russians. But we didn't crush the Russian economy. And we are at the same situation. And I, and I do not agree with you. There is a third solution, and that's the catastrophe. It's either the Russian, they continue advancing. And I'm perfectly sure, because it's written in their doctrine and what they're saying, the Russians. It's if Ukraine remains... Well, the, 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 if, the, if we continue to, to bring Ukraine into NATO, they will go until the Dnieper River. And maybe they will have some problem with the populations, but they will do what Stalin did. They will just push those who are not willing to live under Russian rule to the West and bring back the, all the Russian Ukrainians, which, which are 8 to 9 million people in Russia, back in the new occupied territory, which is Kharkov, uh, Sumy, uh, Zaporizhia, uh, and Odessa, even Putin said it. Odessa is a Russian uh, city. What do you mean when Putin said that? He meant that he wants to take it. Don't believe uh, it. Well, no, <laughs> I, I mean that he wants I to mean, take it. Uh, how, how that's his reality. How can you say, for example, that Putin is saying that Odessa is Russian? He said I've, got, I've, I've got people in Odessa from my family there. They were speaking Russian. They had a Russian passport. They have burned their Russian passports and say no longer Russia. And the Russian, right? the Russian army was not able to go behind Nikolaev. They were not able to go to Odessa. They will not go to cross another time the Nip River. And, uh, what, what, but going back to a, a more serious uh, problem, which is the, the Geneva uh, meeting, my impression is because Russia will not be there, uh, Mr. Biden will probably not be there, there will be discussion with the Ukrainian to go 
how far we will go, where we will start our discussion between us, who are allied with uh, Ukraine, before going to speak with Russia. And that that's mean that probably, probably, uh, but, there will be a sort of agreement between Western countries where how far can we go? Are you sure that the international... But isn't that what... There's a big NATO summit coming up in July. Isn't yeah. that what that's for? Oh, yeah. the NATO summit is something else. I mean, the same NATO summit, as you know, uh, NATO is increasing its, uh, its capability in uh, Eastern Europe with uh, 300,000 troops. Right, so, so ready. It's getting everyone to sing on the same page uh, from the same hymn sheet, sorry, mixing my metaphors, uh, uh, that, uh, they don't need Geneva for that. No, no, no. I mean, you're not split between the NATO summit, which is something else. It's to defend Europe right. on the border of the current NATO uh, thing. And the summit in Geneva, which is a discussion about how far we'll go to support Ukraine in what Ukraine wants to achieve at the end of the war. And that, that is very important because we're in 2024, we can say, are you sure that we'll go back to the international border with, with Crimea and Donbass back in Ukraine? Or we will not be able to do that? And so we need to have another purpose, another objective. And that, that will be really the discussion in, uh, in Geneva. That's my guess. Gulliver Craig? Um, it's not Geneva, just to be precise. It's in some small resort place near uh, Luzerne. Um, yes, sorry. But, um, <laughs> sorry for, for being pedantic about that. But, nice um, city. Just, <laughs> sorry, but, and uh, apart from that, what's the question, Francois? Well, the question is, we're looking forward to, uh, to, to, yeah, to getting people to agree on, on what's the plan for Ukraine with Ukraine. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look like, in a, in a way, on the surface of things, it doesn't look like a great idea for Ukraine to hold this summit and call it a peace summit and then, you know, be disappointed by not having as, as many people attended as they kind of uh, build it but, as. But, but that said, if I may, Gulliver, saying, if, if I may, sorry? Gulliver, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky is going to have a chance to make his pitch in person. Next week, he's been invited to commemorations of D-Day that Joe Biden will be attending. Yes, and by the way, there are a lot of rumours in Ukraine at the moment that um, something will be announced uh, about um, French-Ukrainian uh, cooperation mm -hmm. at, at meeting uh, in Normandy. But just going back to the summit in Switzerland, some people are still arguing that it's actually a pretty clever, um, you know, trick on the behalf of the Ukrainian diplomacy to basically have a peace plan that's currently being labelled the Zelensky formula, which he actually outlined in late 2022, you know, which is basically peace can only be achieved if the Russians pull all their forces out of Ukraine for the sort of plan that Ukraine's allies have signed up to being no longer the Zelensky formula, but a formula that as many countries as possible have signed up to. And it's a way of sort of shoring up their alliances and making their case, which is, you know, despite everything uh, that uh, that George Kosmanovich has been saying, you know, is, is that it's hard to imagine any kind of peace uh, if Ukraine doesn't win this war, despite the fact that it looks so hard for that to be achieved, uh, the current state of things. Gulliver Craig, many thanks for being with us uh, from Kiev uh, for this edition. I want to thank as well uh, Mireille Clapeau, uh, Dominique Trinquant, George Kuzmanovich. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.